Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Tessia and today I wanted to discuss healing. I wanted to cover, someone actually asked me how I got healing and deliverance in a nutshell and I kind of wanted to cover that or go over that. Healing and deliverance are two different things but they go hand in hand. In order to have full healing, typically you need deliverance and um, in order to be delivered, you will need to be healed. Um, in certain areas and I'll explain more what I mean by that as we go along um, But they are separate healing is not deliverance and deliverance is not healing. However um, as you uh, Receive more healing you'll find that you'll all of a sudden be delivered in some area or as you receive deliverance You'll find that you'll be healed in some area. So They work together. They work in tandem, but they are two separate things um, the first thing that I wanted to share or elaborate on would be that the very beginning of my healing journey and my deliverance journey would be changing mindsets. So one of the, I was an alcoholic and an addict. For those of you who don't know, I came from a divorced home um, and went off to college, became an alcoholic and an addict. There was a lot of wounding and pain and trauma in my childhood and in my heart that I hadn't dealt with. And I developed very self um, destructive habits. Um, and so I had a mindset or a belief that I was worthless, that um, I was unlovable, that I wasn't valuable, that I wasn't good at anything, um, that I was a failure, um, that I was lazy. All of these things were lived out in my life and as well as spoken over my life at some points and times. Um, but I really, I think at the root of a lot of my um I think wounding and pain and issues was worthlessness. I really felt worthless. I felt valueless and um, my I lived it out. I treated myself and my life like I had no value and like life had no value. So how, how do you get deliverance? How do you get healing? The first thing that I want to say is God wants to make you into someone who can resist Satan. God not only wants to heal you and deliver you, but he wants to make you into a warrior, someone who can fight and someone who can push back against Satan. So God will not do everything for you. He will train you and teach you and enable you and help you mold you and shape you into the person that he wants you to become. So the first time I heard this idea, I was two years into, um, my Christian walk. And in those first two years, I would say that I went through counseling. Um, I went to sobriety programs. I, uh, you know, did a lot of workbooks and things that kind of showed me how to self evaluate and uh, see where I was at, identify truth from lies. That was one of the very first exercises I did is I um, would make a list of lies and then I would write down the truth to combat those lies. And the specific truth would be Bible verses. So um, if I, the lie was I'm worthless, the truth is you are fearfully and wonderfully made, um, Psalm 139. Uh, or even Ephesians 2, where it talks about us being God's handiwork and he has good works for us to, to walk in. That is contrary to being worthless. If you're valuable, you're God's handiwork. Um, also verses about Jesus dying for us shows our value. So I would combat the lies with truth. That is one of the very first things I did. But I would say one of the, the first times that I heard the concept of God wanting me to be a warrior was two years into my walk with the Lord. Um, my now husband, he wasn't my husband at the time, shared with me some things about how God wants to deliver me out of the trap of my mind because my mind, I'd get so stuck in my mind. I, I would say one thing and then reason another. And um, I would try to figure out the problem of my life in my mind and my um, now husband, but then just friend or even acquaintance shared that God wants to deliver me from the maze of my mind and he wants to be the answer and the way out and he wants to make me into a warrior. And I had never really heard that concept before that God wants to make me into a warrior. God wants to make me into a fighter. God wants to make me someone who's resilient and who it can persevere and who can overcome Th these concepts while um, presented, you know, theologically in church, 
had not been presented to me in my personal life. It's like, yes, I can overcome in Christ, but to really become someone who overcomes, you're going to face opposition. And opposition is an opportunity to overcome. All opposition is an opportunity to overcome. So one of the first things that I had to wrap my, my brain around and get new thinking on, because, you know, the Bible, Romans 12, says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So while we are saved um, and our spirits are made alive in Christ at regeneration, our minds and our experience of sanctification and walking out the Christian life happens um, in a renewing process. So by the renewing of your mind, you know, you'll be transformed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So I had to have a new thought process and a new way of thinking about who I was in Christ and who God wanted me to be. And God wanted me to be a warrior. He wanted me to be victorious. He wanted me to overcome in him. And that meant that I had to show up to the battle and I had to fight and push back. I was someone who was easily pushed back, easily overcome. And um, God wanted to change that in me. So I had to adopt this mindset of I am a warrior and um, God destines me to be victorious in Christ. There is a verse in Romans 8. It's Romans 8, 29 that says, um, talking about those in Christ, it says God, those he uh, predestined. He, well, I'll pull it up right now because the Bible's right in front of me. Uh, Romans 8, 29 says, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And then it says, And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. But in Romans 8, 29, it says, those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And something God showed me about that is God is more committed to me being conformed to the image of Christ than I am committed to me being conformed to the image of Christ. God predestined, God foreknew, God had a plan, and he wants me and he wants you to be conformed to the image of Christ. And God is more committed to that plan and that purpose than you are. So as much as you think that you want to be conformed to the image of Christ, God wants it more for you. And James 1 says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. So trials come to, to test us and grow us and mature us. Um, in Peter, it says that the testing of your faith, um, which is of greater worth than gold, may be proved genuine. So the testing of our faith is, is of great wor greater worth than gold to God, and he wants us to have genuine faith. So trials produce in us what um, God wants. It's refining, and it produces in us the character or the image of Jesus Christ. So all that being said, I had to have a new mindset that I am a warrior, I am victorious, and um, I have the mind of Christ. That's another verse, having the mind of Christ. So all of that being said, um, the very first time I experienced deliverance, I would say, is I had to have a new mindset about demons and how they influence a human being and an individual. There is much, much, much resort of uh, research on this, I guess. There's many resources out there about this. A great teacher is Derek Prince. Uh, I believe a lot of what he shares and what he uh, holds to or adheres to, I think it's biblically sound and spiritually accurate. So if you want to know more um, about demons and demonology, I would go check out Derek Prince. But one of the first things that I had to understand is that demons can influence um, the word in the New Testament for possessed is, is some Greek word meaning demonized. And that word actually means to be under the influence of. So that doesn't actually mean possessed. It just means that a demon can come and influence you. Just like when um, someone drinks alcohol, they are under the influence of alcohol. That doesn't mean their total life or their entire life is um, always under the influence of alcohol. It's when they are under the influence of it. But addiction can be a whole nother thing that pulls at you and, and you can be under the influence of. So I had to wrap my mind around or um, realize that 
demons can come and influence me. Dem demons can talk to me. Demons can, um, they are a personality. A s demon is a personality that opposes you. And once I understood this concept, I was enabled to fight. So I'll give you an example. My very first, uh, I would say, victory or battle in spiritual warfare that I felt victorious in was my battle against depression. I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder. I was on medication. I did not take my medication very consistently. Um, I was kind of bad at taking things consistently and staying in a routine. And so I take it and then I wouldn't take it and then I take it and I wouldn't take it. But I, I struggled with the idea that God wouldn't heal me from depression. A year and well, almost two years, I should say, almost two years into my Christian walk, it was being presented to me that depression is something I'm going to have to live with. It is my thorn in the flesh and God wants to be glorified through my depression. Now, other people were telling me that God doesn't want me to be depressed. Depression isn't from him and he wants to heal me. And so I had to make a choice because I believed if God could heal me from addiction, then God has to be able to heal me from depression. There's no way that, that God can heal me and deliver me from being an alcoholic, but he can't heal me and deliver me from depression. So as soon as I accepted that depression was not myself, it wasn't me. Because I always thought it was me. Like, what's wrong with me? I'm so sad. I'm so heavy. Um, I I can't do, you know get up. I can't have energy. I can't be motivated. What's wrong with me? And as soon as I realized that there was a spirit or another entity coming and imposing its will on me, making me heavy, making me sad, making me depressed and in despair, um, I now had the power to and the will to resist it. So James 4, 6 through 8, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So you submit yourself to God, and then you resist the devil. You have to resist Satan, and he will flee from you. So as soon as I started resisting depression and saying, this is not God's will for me in Christ, whatever this spirit is, I reject you in Jesus' name. You have no rights to my life. You cannot come here and, and make my body your home because, you know, Matthew 12 talks about uh, spirits coming and making people their home. Um, and if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit, that spirit will come back. So Matthew 12, 43, when an impure spirit, this is Jesus speaking, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and live there. So it's talking about a person. It, you know, it's house. It, it's a person. Um, and the final condition of that person is worse than the first. So demons think of humans as houses. They think of humans as where they belong and how they can carry out their wicked, evil desires. So a spirit of depression, as soon as I identified this thing, because I mean, there are angels and there are demons and there are real spirits in the world that come and visit us and can approach us at any time. Um, but that doesn't mean that they own us or they possess us. We have to resist them. Uh, I would say that human beings are like broken cities. So there's a verse in Proverbs, I believe, that talks about uh, a man being like a city. And when we are wounded and broken and we're growing up in this world and we don't really have God as our covering and our protection and we're not really following him, we are a broken down city. And, um, Demons can be like gangbangers in uh, a ghetto. And when God purchases your city and makes you new, he owns that city, but the demons have to be expelled out of the different areas of wounding that are in your heart and your being. So it doesn't mean that they immediately vacate or evacuate. Demons trespass. They um, go on to property that doesn't belong to them and claim that it, it belongs to them. They trespass into your life and you have to resist them. You have to um, be the one to stand and occupy your being, occupy your body, your mind, your heart, and, and resist. Say, no, you cannot come onto my property. You can't tell me what to think. You can't make me feel that way. And this is where discernment 
discernment comes in. In 1 Corinthians 14, I believe, it talks about dis- the gift of discerning spirits. So God wants us to be able to discern spirits and know what spirits are of him and what spirits aren't of him. Uh, the concept of evil spirits and demons is not foreign to God or to Jesus Christ in his ministry. So as soon as I adopted the mindset that demons are real and demons can affect me and demons can speak to my mind, lie to me. You know, Satan is the father of lies. So he can come with a thought and lie to your mind, lie to you uh, in your emotions, make you feel or think something that isn't true. And then you fall into that trap. And, And instead of resisting lies, people tend to embrace lies because they are wounded in that area, especially in areas of wounding. People will embrace lies because, um, they haven't been fortified in the truth yet. They haven't believed the truth and adhered to the truth in that area. An example could be, um, I'm a failure. If you believe that you're a failure and you don't have enough success in your life in Christ to believe that you're a success, anytime the devil comes and tells you you're a, you're a failure, either be it in the area of diet, the area of work, the area of finances, the area of exercise, whatever area, the area of order and cleanliness, whatever area it is, the area of parenting, if you don't believe that you're a success in Christ, not on your own, but in Christ, in, in his ability, in his strength, because his grace is sufficient, if you believe you're a failure, well, then you, the devil could come tell you you're a failure, you're a failure, and you'll just give up. You'll quit. You won't even try because why, why try? You're a failure. That's what I believed. I believed I was a failure. So I kind of adopted this attitude of why even try if I'm going to fail anyways? Just don't try. Just give up before you fail. Then you don't have to be uh, suffering the embarrassment and the pain of failure. So, um... This is where the truth and lies come in. You have to combat the lies with the truth. So once I realized that Satan can lie to me and speak to me and demons can come and impose their will on me, um, Ephesians 6, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but what do we wrestle against? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our battle, our struggle, our wrestling is against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. You got to wrestle. You got to fight them. So the very first time I overcame was through truth and resisting the devil. It was a period of six weeks. As soon as I understood that depression was a spirit that comes and visits me and sits on me, um, it was a period of six weeks in which I actively resisted Satan. And um, I one day, I very, very, very specifically remember I was walking. I was feeling kind of depressed that day. I felt like God said, go take a walk get out of the house. Don't sit here. So I got out of the house. I took a walk and I was listening to the Bible. I was listening to Matthew nine. And in Matthew nine, Jesus does three different healings. He heals two blind men. He heals the woman with the issue with blood. And he raises, um, I believe it's Jairus's daughter. So he raises a 12 year old from the dead. So in, uh, Matthew nine, After the woman with the issue with blood, she says, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I know that I'll be healed. So she touches him and Jesus says, who touched me? And she said it was me. And Jesus says to her, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well or your faith has healed you. And in that moment, God spoke to me, take heart, daughter, take heart, Tessia, you're my daughter. Your faith will make you well. Your faith will heal you. You may not be where you want to be today, but put your faith in me and you will be healed. You will be delivered of depression. Very soon after that, um, I was totally delivered from depression. Now, I want to say that I did not receive healing from a deliverance session against the spirit of depression. People did pray for me. Um, People prayed for me many times that I would be delivered from depression. I prayed many times that I would be delivered from depression, but it wasn't a one and done thing. I had to be made into a person who could resist depression. I had to be conformed into the image of Christ. Christ is not overcome by a spirit of depression. And 
uh, Isaiah 61, I believe it is, says, I will give you the garment of praise for the spirit of despair. So right there, you can know that depression is a spirit. Despair is a spirit. It's what the Bible names it as. So there are spirits and um, depression is a spirit. So people had prayed for me, but I did not receive instantaneous deliverance. I had to become a person who could maintain my deliverance. And I would say this is the truth um, that I have seen as I've prayed for people as I've um, been in ministry, the, the truth that holds true is someone who can maintain their deliverance keeps their deliverance. But someone who's prayed for and delivered only for a short while, if they don't have the tools in place in their life to maintain their deliverance, if the building blocks aren't in their spiritual foundation, they will not maintain their deliverance. They'll, they'll be like that person in Matthew 12 who um, the evil spirit comes back with seven more and the condition of that person is worse than the first. If you are not grounded in the Holy Spirit, if you are not um, versed in the truth, reading your Bible, in your Bible, knowing the truth, um, you won't maintain your deliverance. And that brings us to our next point. So I experienced deliverance from depression. I experienced the power of God, the healing of God, the freedom of God. And I just want to say at the beginning of those six weeks, I had gone off all my medication. My medication wasn't very high. And because I wasn't taking it very regularly, um, it was spotty anyways. So I could just stop taking it because I hadn't really been on it in a consistent basis for a long period of time because um, I wasn't very responsible with medication. So I stopped taking my medication at the beginning of those six weeks. And I said, God, I believe you're going to heal me. And um, it wasn't that I had said in six weeks, I'll be free. Uh, I wanted to be free, you know, pretty much immediately. But it was about six weeks that I would say it was a season of real struggle, real resistance, real fighting. And I got free. The next thing I struggled with, because I was... Um, an alcoholic and an addict, I had tormenting thoughts that would come and visit my mind and kind of shove memories of past people, past places, um, a past identity into me. Uh, I was blessed enough to leave the location. All of my addiction happened in California and I came to Arizona um, at the beginning of my sobriety because I'm from here. So I returned home like the prodigal son. I had a prodigal son experience. So I, all of my addiction happened in another place. So I didn't have any physical triggers of people or places um, that could really trigger me. But I would say that I had these tormenting thoughts of the past that would visit me and um, they weren't thoughts that I wanted. And I always would feel condemnation. I would feel guilt. Um, I would just feel bad. I, I did not, it wasn't like I was sitting around thinking these thoughts and feeling good about it. And, you know, it was a good time. No, I felt tormented by it. So that was something that I really was praying that God would deliver me from these tormenting thoughts. And I was praying for a long time. And I'm going to, God at the time led me to Deuteronomy 7. And I would encourage you read the whole chapter of Deuteronomy 7. It talks about driving out the nations before them. It talks about driving them out and totally destroying them, not leaving any remnant, not leaving any vestige of them uh, because these people were unholy. And I believe that God was showing me that this is what is gonna happen with the demonic in my life, that there can't be any attachment to any of the demonic. I have to totally um, like break up with it and kind of hate it with the hatred of God and uh, really want nothing to do with it because the devil can seduce you or tempt you into thinking that there's parts of your past identity that are good, that you miss that you um, long for, that you feel fond about. Wasn't that a good time? And the truth is, none of it is good. Um, there's the, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away and the new is here. So you don't want to long for the dead man. <laughs> you don't want to resurrect your sinful self. You want to, Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Um, Isaiah 43, 18 says, do not dwell on the past. Um, another version says, forget the former things. Uh, that's what it says. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. So it says it twice. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. And then it says, see, I am doing a new thing. Do. Uh, do you not perceive it? Um, I am making streams in the wilderness and uh, 
Oh, waters, I'm making water away in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland, something like that. Um, but it's Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. So God tells us, don't, don't remember the past. Don't long for the past. Don't look at the past. Don't dwell on former things. Look ahead. Look at the new thing, especially if you're in Christ. Don't be longing for your old identity. So I believe in Deuteronomy 17, that's what God was saying about the demonic in my life, as well as um, my uh, old identity. It had to be destroyed. It had to be totally killed. And there can't be any part of it that was left remaining. Uh, Deuteronomy 7 verse 7 was also something that really helped me. It says, the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other peoples. For you were the fewest of all peoples, but it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Well, I felt like God brought me out with a mighty hand and delivered me from the power of slavery, from uh, addiction, the king of alcohol. So um, God knowing that God loves you and that he is for you and that he is with you and that he wants you to succeed will be very foundational in getting your deliverance and your freedom because God is the one who frees you. The Holy Spirit is the one who delivers you. You don't deliver yourself. You're not stronger than Satan. It is only the blood of Jesus. It is only the power of God that delivers you. So knowing that he loves you and he's for you and he's on your side is going to help you have faith that he wants to deliver you, heal you, and make you well. Um, but the very, the important verse that I want to get to is Deuteronomy, um, seven verse 21 through 23. Deuteronomy seven verse 21 through 23 says, do not be terrified by them for the Lord, your God who is among you is a great and awesome God. The Lord, your God will drive out those nations before you little by little. You will not be allowed to eliminate them all at once, or the wild animals will multiply around you. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you, throwing them into great confusion until they are destroyed. And when I read that, I knew that God was speaking to me and telling me that the demonic in my life will not be cast out all in one shot. I won't overnight be delivered from fear, be delivered from, de uh, well, depression, be delivered from tormenting thoughts, be delivered from hesitation, be delivered from everything in my life all at once. God told me that if that happened, I wouldn't be able to maintain my deliverance. I would be overrun by um, the wild animals. And so God said, I'm going to deliver you little by little. But as I deliver you, I'm going to make you into the person who I want to make you into who can maintain your deliverance. Philippians 1 6 says, um, because he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So you got to believe and know that God who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He is not going to abandon you. He is not going to stop short. He is going to sanctify you, but it doesn't happen in an instant. And I think that's the problem with a lot of um, deliverance ministries today is people go to get delivered and they think that this is it. This is all I have to do. I just have to receive prayer and be delivered and then everything will be perfect. Everything will be great. But the truth is, Spirits can come and spirits can go. And God wants you to be someone who can resist Satan and resist temptation when it comes. God will constantly be there to help you and strengthen you and enable you. But if you always need to go receive prayer from someone else to be delivered, um, that means that it's not just you and God, it's you and God and someone else. And God wants to make you into someone who can resist Satan and stand firmly in his spirit and solely on his word and um, be confident in him. So in order for God to do that, he has to strengthen you. He has to build faith into you. He has to build a will into you. There has to be a um, wellspring of knowledge of the truth. You know, going back to Romans, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to know the truth in order to stand on the truth. So God will deliver you little by little. He will make you into he, who he wants to make you into. 
So that was a very important thing for me to realize. I would challenge you to read all of Deuteronomy 7. It's not that long of a chapter. It's a very powerful, meaty chapter. But for me to know God loves me and God's not going to do this in, in one shot. Because I would pray and pray and pray and pray, God, deliver me, deliver me. And God, he taught me how to be perseverant in prayer. He taught me how to trust him and his timing. He taught me how to be dependent on him. He taught me how to have a will that resists temptation. So there's things that God built into me in the midst of receiving my deliverance and my healing that all work together. It's not just one component or one part. It all works together. So... That was a really important point that um, God made to me at the beginning of my uh, even deeper deliverance or healing journey. Uh, the next thing that I wanted to share was, or one of the last things I guess would be Ephesians 4. So I was um, praying for a long time to be delivered from these troubling thoughts and from spirits from the past that would visit me and torment me. Um, and God showed me I need to believe who I am in him. I need to believe that I'm made new. I need to stand in the new identity. Um, Paul talks a lot about the old identity and the new identity. And Ephesians 4, also a great chapter to read and to study. I have gotten much out of Ephesians 4 in regards to being um, old and being new and having a new heart and a new mind. But Ephesians 4, 21 or 20 says that however is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires so that's something you have to do that's something I had to do I had to put off the old self anytime the old self tried to resurrect itself in depression in fear in isolation in um, sadness in failure in um, complacency you know all these old habit patterns old behaviors I would have to put that off. I would have to actively make a choice to say, I'm not going to behave like that anymore. And verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So God spoke that to me. I'm in the new creation in Christ. I am being made new in the attitude of my mind. I felt like the battle was in my mind, that um, these thoughts would come and torment me in my mind and cause me to feel all these emotions, fear, condemnation, frustration, um, sadness. And God said, you are being made new in the attitude of your mind, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, abide in my spirit, believe my truth. Either I paid for all your sins on the cross or I didn't. What are you going to combat these thoughts with when they come? Are you going to, to come under them and agree with them and say, yes, I am, you know, I was such a bad sinner and I'm so sad about it and God, please forgive me. Yes, ask for forgiveness. But once you've repented, you know, five, ten times, you don't need to repent anymore. I mean, once, once you truly repented of it, once is enough. But I mean, after a period of time, there's, you should grieve over your sin, but you can't just keep repenting for something you've already repented from. At some point, it becomes torment and you have to resist the tormentor and say, hey, you can't do this to me anymore. I am made new. I am forgiven. The blood of Jesus um, is enough. Colossians 2, 9, I believe it is, talks about our, the legal indebtedness our our legal debt to god was nailed to the cross so the devil comes because he's a legalist and he'll say oh you are such a guilty sinner because of this and this and this and this but our legal indebtedness was nailed to the cross um it's 2 13 Colossians 2.13, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. Other translation says he put them to open shame, triumphing over them by the cross. So God confronted me with, do you believe my word? Do you believe the truth? Are you standing in my spirit? Are you standing in your own righteousness? Are you living in doubt? Are you living in unbelief? Are you living in fear? Um, and these are all the things that God wants to uh, reveal to us and show us and transform in us. 
I do believe that fear is a spirit. Doubt is a spirit. Unbelief is a spirit. Now, when you agree with these spirits, you now own that doubt and that doubt becomes yours and you can't um, blame your sin on the spirit of doubt. You can, you, you must repent of your sin and, and not enter into doubt um, and ask God to forgive you and help you. But I do believe that these things are spirits and, and these spirits come in and seduce and tempt and deceive. The devil's greatest weapon is deception. He wants to deceive you into thinking that it's your fault um, you're the one with the problem and you keep doing this. And really you have to be able to identify what is, what is God, what is Satan and what is self. There's three different entities going on. Sometimes it's just self rising up. Sometimes it's Satan deceiving you. And then sometimes it's God speaking to you. And you got to be able to discern in your Christian life, what voice it is. You also have to, um, I would say the two biggest things that in my healing and deliverance were changing my mindset and prayer. I had to let God show me the truth about demons, demonology, how they work, how they operate, um, how I was letting them operate in my life, where I needed to change and resist them. And um, prayer, praying and trusting that God wanted to deliver me, God wanted to heal me and believing that he would. Not just saying, heal me, deliver me, heal me, deliver me, and never expecting results. I expected results. And God, in faith, I expected results because that's what God says that we should do. When we pray to him, we should believe and not doubt. Mark 11. If you believe and you don't doubt, you'll have whatever you ask for in prayer. Jesus said that. So I expected results. Some of the resources that helped me in getting healing and deliverance were Mending the Soul by Stephen R. R. Tracy. Um, it is a book about overcoming trauma and sexual abuse in, from a Christian perspective. I was not sexually abused, but I felt like a lot of um, the principles that he shared in that book helped me. Um, another one is Inside Out by Larry Crabb. It, he was a counselor, is a counselor, talked about in that book, um, kind of, we think that more prayer and more Bible reading and more um, doing Christian things will change us when truthfully we really have to get to the heart of the matter and let God come in and change us. We can't change ourselves. Um, that was a very powerful book and insightful and helped me. And the third resource I would say is Derek Prince Ministries. As soon as I started learning more about spiritual warfare, demons, and demonology, um, I was equipped I became better equipped in the spirit of God to resist Satan in my day-to-day -day life and to cling to the truth. And the more victory and success you have, the stronger you get and the better you feel and the more victorious you become. So as I gained victory, I kind of kept getting stronger and stronger and higher and higher and felt better and better. So that is um, a very long nutshell, but that's kind of how I got healing and deliverance in a nutshell. And I would say that um, I still face spiritual warfare today, lots of spiritual warfare. Um, I still have to resist Satan. I still have to identify when I'm being manipulated or lied to or when um, I'm not. I still have to crucify my flesh and my sinful desires. You know, Ephesians 4 said your deceitful desires. So there's still things going on and happening, but I'm not struggling with the same things. I'm, I have, I'm having different struggles. I'm not struggling with the same areas. I don't feel as broken, as wounded, as damaged, as unlovable. Um, I definitely know that I'm loved. I know that I'm valuable. I know that God, I have much, much more trust and faith and hope in God. Um, hopelessness also was something I used to struggle with. So I pray that this video blesses you. I pray it encourages you. Um, if you have any questions about anything that I shared or any questions you'd want me to answer, please comment below or send me a message um, on my website. And I would love to be able to answer some of your questions. Also, like this video if you liked it. Share it with someone who you think it may encourage or bless. And I pray you all have a blessed and a beautiful day, a day filled with God's beauty. Bye.